what is baromenology? Now, if you just stop by and you clicked on this YouTube and you're like, I have no idea what baromenology is. I'm going to click on this and find out what baromenology is. Well, I can tell you, you're going to learn a lot about what baromenology is. Baromenology is the study of created kinds, the study of the organisms that God created. And specifically, it's asking the question, what things did God create, right? In there in the garden, when Adam is told to name the animals, what animals walked up to Adam or what animals that did God bring to Adam that Adam would look at and say, that is a giraffe, right? Did he bring a fox to Adam and say, Adam said, I'm going to call that a fox. And then the next animal that walked up was a wolf. And he said, I'm going to call that a wolf. Uh, actually, most younger creationists would say, no, foxes and wolves are really the same kind. So therefore, Adam didn't name foxes and he didn't name wolves. He named a canine kind. Um, so maybe he just said canine, you know, for that particular type of animal, which would also include your domesticated dog. Um, so that's what we're here to learn. What is baromenology and how are we going to learn what baromenology is? Well, I have a great article to share with you to talk about this. Uh, it comes from the New Creation blog, which is a Young Earth Creationist uh, website. Um, they posted in their Creation Basics series. This article is by Christian Ryan, who's a, who's a young creationist writer who is sort of uh, synthesizing information from other creationists and then um, presenting it to this audience at the New Creation blog. And Christian Ryan is a really fantastic writer. Uh, I really enjoy how he sees the big picture and and sets out the big questions. And that's why this is my, my recommended go-to source for understanding the basics of what is baromenology. What does a creationist mean when they say, uh, I'm studying baromenology? I'm interested in the, the science of created kinds. And more importantly, and the reason I'm going to read down through this article and talk about it is uh, Christian does a great job of identifying what are the core elements of what makes baromenology baromenology, what are the core questions that baromenology is trying to answer, and then what are some of the challenges of baromenology, and that's where I think things get really interesting. Um, so let me, let's just get started here. It's got a great setup. You know, he says, hey, there's different, you know, just look outside. There's a whole bunch of different organisms out there. And we would say that's the, 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 the amazing part of life, right? That there is so many different living organisms. Everybody can recognize that there is an amazing amount of diversity on this earth. Um, now, as he points out, most scientists believe, here, let's highlight this here. Most scientists believe that these life forms can trace their ancestry back billions of years to LUCA, which is the last universal common ancestor. Um, now, he does not think that we can trace everything back to the last universal common ancestor because there isn't one because God created the kind separately from one another and they don't share any ancestry. Um, but the question is, what organisms that are alive outside your window do share common ancestors? Or surely God didn't create every single one of the individuals you see as I look out my window. Every individual organism that I see was not created separately by God with no shared history with any other organism, right? Uh, you know, there's a, there's a chipmunk outside there, and that chipmunk, there's other chipmunks. I suspect that those chipmunks are related to a parental chipmunk that gave birth to them, and therefore they have an ancestor. And I think that the chipmunks that were out there five years ago uh, probably are the ans were, were probably the ancestors of the chipmunks that are there today, right? So we can keep going back and there are ancestors and there's ancestors and there's ancestors to those ancestors and so forth. And of course, baromenology is going to have to address the fundamental question, at what point does it stop? Where can you stop putting together descendants and finding ancestors and say, this is the ancestor that God created, like that he made, God made this one separate from all other types of living things on earth. And from that point forth, it has been giving rise to descendants. And then the, another fundamental question is going to be, I'm giving away some of this early material here. Another fundamental question would be, 
as those give rise to descendants, how much can those descendants change and vary and become what we might identify as different species? Or can they become different genera? Or could they even become different families? They might become so different. That's one of the challenges of baromenology. Uh, but I get ahead of myself. Let's work our way down through here. Um, the Bible gives us a completely different view on the origin of biodiversity. The first chapter of Genesis records God supernaturally creating the diverse forms of life forms in the beginning, many kinds of plants and animals, so forth, in the air, the land, and so forth, um, already existed. How do we, who do the classification systems we use today correspond to those created kinds? And that that is, uh, you know, we have a, I mean, I think most people have grown up learning some classification system, right? That there are individual canines, uh, dog species, but they're in a genus, say the wolves, and of which there's several different types of wolves. And then they're in a larger group called a family and so forth. How, do that, how does that correspond with the, the, the Hebrew word mean, which is the word that is translated in our English as kind? That is one of the fundamental questions. And so here we go. Let's start and let's just go down his questions and uh, talk about them. Have species changed since creation? I've already suggested that they have, and young earth creationists um, agree that species have changed. Um, he's right that many people associate young earth creation with the concept of fixity of species, which is an erroneous concept from hundreds of years ago um, that species never change, right? That they're incapable of changing and that the species are here, present here now are the ones that have always existed. Um, sure, Christian, Christians have believed that in the past, but young earth creationists that are alive today do not trace themselves to that particular history. They have always believed that there is some flexibility, uh, adaptability of species or of kinds, such that kinds can change and adapt to their environments to some extent. Now, how they do that, they disagree about, but they don't disagree that that can happen. So first of all, he's pointing out that yes, they can change, right? Um, and he's saying that, you know, that's, you know, we've always believed that, that's not a problem. All right, so that's not a problem. The problem comes in how much of that change can happen. And he's gonna discuss that. Um, what does a mean, right? Uh, a mean is uh, over the years, uh, well, let's see here. Well, let's just read, let's just read this section. Seeing as uh, the book of Genesis is a historical account and not a biology textbook, it uses the word mean very few times. All right, mean is the word used in the early uh, portions of the Old Testament that refers to what sounds like particular identifiable units of organism, living things. But he's right. The word is not crystal clear. It's not like there's a definition there that says, I mean, is this, and here's how you define it. It's simply used in context with talking about particular birds. But sometimes the, the, the context suggests a larger, sort of broader definition of what a mean is. And sometimes it feels like it's talking about a species. And I like the fact that he says, hey, Genesis is a, it's a historical account, but it's not a biology textbook. It's not there to give us the specific scientific details. This makes it very difficult to define. <laughs> That's for sure. I mean, there's so many articles about trying to define this, and creationists have different definitions. Nevertheless, we can examine the textual context wherever the word appears, and that helps us understand what it means. Okay, it gives us some clues. Over the years, researchers have developed a number of proposed definitions. Yeah, many definitions. Despite differences of opinion, this is kind of putting it mildly, <laughs> there are differences of opinion among creationists about, about the definition of a, of a mean. They all unite on the same basic idea, and this is true. This is that the kind represents an organism's lineage that was originally created by God and diversified into the many diverse forms with the passage of time. But yes, I think all young earth creationists agree to that, that the mean or the kind um, is supposed to represent what God created at the beginning uh, in the six days of creation. And since then, uh, they have been allowed to diversify into many diverse forms over the passage of time. Right. By the way, change over time is the basic definition of, of evolution, but we'll get to 
um, the, the definitions of evolution within creationism a little bit later as we, as, what does it mean? There are definitions of it. However, I'm not going to give you the definition here right now just yet. I'm just telling you what the history of this is. And we can't agree on this, that it's a real thing. It's a unit. But now the question becomes, what is that unit? Like, how are we going to figure out what things share ancestors that are alive today and what organisms that are alive right now do not share any common ancestry at all? And they're created separately from one another. So he uses this sort of analogy here, the archipelago of life. We can picture the diversity of life as thousands of islands scattered across a vast ocean. Each island of diversity represents a mean, a recognizable group of organisms that we call biblical kind. The group persists as its members interbreeding and reproducing similar offspring. So this is actually, by the way, something very similar to something I might say in my class when I, I teach a systematics class, because I'm a taxonomist by training, and taxonomy is the secular term for baromenology, really. Um, and in, I might talk about when we get when we start talking, I'll be talking about species in this case. And we spend actually a couple of weeks just talking about what is a species and how do we understand what a species is. And we talk about species as being units or whether we can consider them as unit functional units of, of groups of individuals. And those groups of individuals are kind of like, you know, separate little islands, right? That are defined, have defined boundaries. And of the difficult thing with species is sometimes it's really hard to define those boundaries. And that's going to be true also of the word mean and kind. It's very difficult to define those boundaries as creationists have discovered. The more they think about it and the more they research it, it feels like the harder it's becoming to define rather than the easier it is to become defined. Now, he does give a little hint here. This group persists in its members uh, 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 by its members interbreeding and producing similar offspring. Uh, that's very similar to the biological species concept, uh, which is that a biological species, you know, like a wolf, are a group of individuals that can interbreed with one another and they generally produce similar offspring, right? They continue to produce the same types of organisms, uh, individuals uh, as themselves. That's sort of a hallmark of what is probably the most commonly understood uh, species concept, although there's many different ways of understanding species. Um, so then considering these islands of bio biodiversity, consider, for example, the diversity we see just within various dog breeds around the world, right? And then he talks about all the different dog breeds. Well, yes, but they're all the same kind of dog. There's 450 of them, and yet they're all really the same kind. Then you add their wild ancestors, right? So he's admitting here, just just on the face of it, that they are the same kind because they share an ancestor. They share a common ancestor. Well, then they can't be separately created if they share ancestors. So foxes, coyotes, uh, even the extinct dire wolf. All right. All of these are in the same family, the canines. I mean, all of them make up a single created the kind, the dog kind. All right. And that, that is the general consensus among young earth creationists. They like to, they would prefer to lump all of the different canines together into a single kind. Uh, then he has this analogy with the sea waves of discontinuity. All right. So for, it's one thing to look for similarities, but you also have to look for where's the discontinuities between kinds, because if God made things separately, there should be some like physical evidence that they're not the same thing, right? There's got to be differences. Um, so separating these island, separating these islands diversity are vast seaways. Uh, now he uses the word vast here to try to emphasize at some point, you know, the, all these organisms are similar to each other and therefore they're all part of the same kind. And we're going to try to define later on what makes them, sh what, whether do they share, but then there's vast differences between them. Like there's a vast difference between a cat and a dog, say in, 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 in most creationist minds, <laughs> not all though. Um, and so that vast difference then is the result of, well, they're separately created. And so as being separately created things, they're not, they're, they're obviously not going to share everything. Um, these can be used to distinguish one major group of organisms, a kind apart from others. The seaways of discontinuity that separate them are perilous and cannot be crossed. Meaning this is the point where they're so different from one another. There's no way for them to cross. Now, the crossing here would mean there's no way for this dog and this cat to interchange genetic material 
and to come up with a dog cat, all right, to share enough information that they could become mixed together. Because two separately created things, uh, by really by definition for the young earth creationist, can never be mixed together um, because they're separately created by God. Um, presumably, organisms from one mean cannot interbreed and that they are not ancestral to the members of any other mean. They are distinct unto themselves. All right. So he's, he's, I think he's doing a good job here of defining, um, you know, the, the theoretical aspect of what a mean is. We have to get down into the practical nitty gritty of, me, of means at one point. Um, let's return to the dog kind. Here's all these different dogs um, and our felines also belong to a completely different mean. In a similar fashion, chickens, pheasants, quail, they represent another one um, and so forth. All right, so here's all these different means. Well, now this then we're getting now close to the, the a big fundamental question and that is, well, how far can you go? Like how big can that mean or kind get, how many different organisms can be included in it? So how do biblical kinds compare to our modern classification ranks, right? So our modern classification ranks, man-made classification systems, such as genus, family, order, right? Those the, that's the kind of the lingo that I'm used to uh, using myself. Uh, this creates problems, however, because these categories are somewhat arbitrary and inconsistent with the amount of diversity they contain. For example, the carnivora contains all species of cats, dogs, bears, uh, seals, and many other animals, right? The carnivora is a, an order above the family. On the other hand, some orders are fairly small and young earth creationists like to actually include everything in an order as a kind, but they would say, but if you move over to this other order like the carnivora, well, the carnivora includes cats and dogs, but we're saying cats and dogs are separate. Uh, different kinds and don't share a common ancestor. And so they can't just they can't just say, okay, you know what our our breaking point is you know everything that's a family, like dog family, the great ape family, the cat family, the mongoose family, um, you know the rabbit family or whatever, right all those things, all of their members in the family, you know, things that are species and genera are similar enough that we think they all share a common ancestor. They're the same kind. But at the level of order where you put two different families together, like the carnivores include multiple different kinds of families together because they honestly, they do share a lot of common features and yet they have differences, right? Cats are different from dogs. But at that level, he's saying they're not the same kind. They're separately created kinds. But in some groups, they may not be quite as different, and therefore we might just want to lump everything even farther down, maybe at the point of an order. And then some groups, maybe a genera, maybe the family's too broad, maybe God created multiple members, like, like maybe the great apes. The great apes are one kind according to answers in Genesis, but as I pointed out, Institute for Creation Research might have reasons to believe that um, chimpanzees are one kind and uh, orangutans are one kind and gorillas are a, a yet a different kind, all separately created and don't share common ancestors, uh, in which case it's at the genus level, not at the family level. Ah, but let's move on. Let's, let's go down here. So what is baromenology? Baromenology is the study of created kinds. Biologists and theologians, such as Carl Linnaeus and Frank Marge, Marsh, like how he throws in Carl Linnaeus, right? Because yeah, Carl Linnaeus was a Christian, but he's the most famous taxonomist, right? He's the one that came out with the binomial naming system, Homo sapiens, boa constrictor, mus mus for mouse, uh, so forth, have dipped their toes in this field for centuries. However, baronology did not get its beginning until the 1990s uh, based on landmark, mark, uh, landmark work by Walter Remine and Dr. Kurt Wise. And Kurt Wise is a member of this particular uh, blog as well and post a lot of, a lot of stuff there. Baromenologists, what did baromenologists do? They carefully study how similar and dissimilar organisms are to each other. That allows them to the best approximation which organisms belong to a single created kind. I mean, that, that, that actually defines a little bit of what I do, right? I'm, I'm a taxonomist by training and I have worked on several groups of plants and I've been asked, I've asked the question, where do these plants belong? Are they separate species? And then for these five different species, are they all in the same genera? 
And these genera, these three genera of plants, do they belong in the same family because they have similarities? And I've named family, I've named genera, and I've named species. Uh, actually, I haven't named families. Named, yes, I have named families. <laughs> I can't remember my own my own literature. Um, families, genera, and species. Uh, and so, and what I'm doing is I'm looking for similarities, like sequencing DNA and finding common uh, sequence themes. And uh, also looking for dissimilarities. Where are the breakpoints between species, breakpoints between genera, and more significant breakpoints between families, and even larger breakpoints and differences between uh, higher uh, groups of classification? Um, so baromenology is, you can think of it as just, it's a, it's a fancy biblically sort of name for what young earth creationists say they're doing, which is really just the same thing that all other classificationists uh, are doing, except that they're they're explicitly trying to find this biblical kind and identify that within the context of all the other understanding of biology uh, that we have. All right, how do we tell one created kind apart from the others? See, I mean, this article is fantastic. It just it just asks the questions that are the most pertinent questions, and then provides the the essential like important information you need to know. Uh, that is kind of been is kind of taken from all the creationist literature and pulled together here. Um, Barrymanologists use set of similarities called additive criteria. They have their own names for all this stuff. So that lumps groups of organisms together that share similarities. Uh, and then if we scroll down here, but barrymanology must also be able to show how one proposed created kind is distinct from other created kinds. To do this, they look at dissimilarities or subtractive criteria. So they have these names for these two different criteria, and they have mathematical models and all kinds of things to try to be able to um, to do statistics and so forth. Um, because at, at the end of the day, it's kind of hard to show what might you might think is the main criteria, which is can they actually reproduce with each other? If they can, they're the same kind. If they can't, they're not. But many different species in the same kind can't reproduce with each other. And but they won't say that they're not part of the same kind. They'll say like, well, that's because there's been mutations and all that. So in other words, the the change in genetics has changed the information such that it obscures the original kindness. All right, it obscures the original information, and therefore it's hard to just look at the genetics or just look at reproduction and be able to instantly tell, oh, I've got a kind or I don't have a kind. And so they're kind of, uh, kind of <laughs> uh, stuck with trying to find other criteria to add to the most obvious criteria, which would be reproducibility or, or um, intercrossing uh, between different species as showing their relationship or common ancestry with each other. All right, so then uh, it goes through some examples of that. Now we get to some some interesting applications, all right? We've kind of defined what we're doing here, and we've said, here are some ways that we try to figure out what a kind is, but why do we do this? That's the first question. Like, what, what kind of good is this gonna do by doing this type of study? All right, he's um, gonna make a couple arguments for problems that he thinks young earth creationism actually solves using barominology. In other words, barominology helps young earth creationists in these ways. And then he's going to follow that up with, uh, there are some things where we just don't quite understand yet. And these are potential problems. So first of all, he says, hey, barominology can be a way of defeating Luca, last universal common ancestor, right? One of the chief differences between creation biology and evolutionary biology is of ancestry. Conventional biologists believe that all life evolved from common ancestor, all right? But barominology allows us to demonstrate that there are gaps or dissimilarities between major groups of organisms that are real and not just apparent, uh, and not apparent. This is strong indication that life arose from a diverse array of ancestors as recorded in the biblical account. That originally there had to be diversity at the very beginning, not from a common ancestor. They think that the dissimilarities that exist between kinds, and if you can show that there's this vast gulf, right? If there's a vast gulf, how are you gonna how are you gonna get over a vast gulf if you're gonna make a dog into a cat? Now, when I said that dog into a cat, that's actually a misconception, and I don't actually think that uh, Christian, you know, I think he understands that misconception, so he's not saying this, but a lot of creationists do this. 
they, they often talk about, well, you can't make a dog into a cat. Well, evolutionary biologists wouldn't say any dog is ever going to become a cat. They share a common ancestor, which is neither a dog nor a cat. And they got, in other words, the gulf was created by time, you know, and their, and their ancestors becoming, and their descendants becoming more different, which creates the gulf that we see today as being the difference. Um, uh, but don't want to go too long on this. So let's move on. It reduces, now I, I was thrilled to see this particular headline here. It reduces the number of animals needed on Noah's Ark. I've been saying this along with others for quite a long time. And that's not anything that creationists have never said. It's just that I, it, it helpful for them to just say, yes, baromenology, at least the way we're defining baromens or kinds now, is helpful for understanding how all the animals got on the ark, right? And he's absolutely right about this. A very common objection raised by against young earth creationists concerns Noah's ark, specifically that Noah could not have possibly fit two of every animal species on the ark. This would, of course, be correct. Be correct because there are th hundreds of thousands of species, right? And if every single one of them had to be on the ark, they, they wouldn't fit. Even in the grand scheme of uh, Ken Ham's uh, ark down there in Kentucky, he could not show that they all fit on there. Um, and But this is not what Noah was told to do in the first place. Rather, God told Noah that he would bring at least two of every kind of air-breathing land animal on the ark. I, I got to admit, I get really frustrated when I see on Facebook or Twitter or something like that. I see atheists or those who just don't understand creationists. They're like, they bring their gotcha question. And the gotcha question is like, that's really, there are millions of species. How could they all fit on the ark? Well, number one, that tells me you don't know your Bible. You don't know creationists. Right. And this is completely ineffective argument um, because it's land, it's land, air breathing animals. That's what was brought onto the ark. Well, that's a far more limited pool than saying like, OK, now all the insects and all the, you know, all these uh, crustaceans and blah, 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 blah. All those had to be on the ark. No, this is not actually what the Bible said. That's not what God told Noah to do. The air breathing land animals. No, whales did not have to be on the ark. They're not land animals. Um, and then in addition, of course, they don't believe that every species was created by God. They believe the kinds were created by God. And by defining kinds as families or something like a family unit, only two canines had to get on the ark. Only two felines, right? Only two great apes had to get on the ark. Uh, that really limits the number of animals. So, so with that, we see that the animals would have been far less than 2,000 ark kinds and probably less than 7,000 total individuals on the ark. I still think that's a, a major task, but that's not like saying millions or even hundreds of thousands of organisms had to be on the ark. And anyone who argues that is just naive about what creationists believe and say. Um, and need to educate themselves a little bit. So, hey, if you came here not knowing what baromenology is, maybe, hopefully, if I could just give you that and, and help you understand baromenology enough to the point that you don't make those kind of silly arguments, um, that will be helpful. Now, fascinating, all right? It explains the existence of some evidence for evolution. How about that for an interesting um, subtitle, uh, subheading here? Anti-creationist literature is filled to the brim with supposed proof that creationism is not true because animals have evolved. The evidence includes vestigial organs, structures, you know, like whale hip bones, intermediate forms, missing links, poorly designed features like panda's thumb and so forth. While baromenology does not completely render the argument void, it does show that many slam dunk cases against young earth creationism are actually great examples of variation within created kinds. You see what having a created kind does for you? If it's a family, any of the variants that are inside of a family, any of the new fe any of the features that differ between family members are not evidence of evolution, or at least you can define away this as evidence of evolution, because that's just variation within a kind. And of course, they're going to say that God sort of place that variation in the original kind, and it simply is expressing itself differently in different species within that kind. Um, and so if you make this 
elaborate argument for how this species became this one and it, and it changed this and they got this feature and this thing swapped around here. And so now you're actually watching the evolution of these different species from one end to the other. Um, Barominology says, eh, that's fine. You can do that. But that's not evolution. That's not evidence that organisms came from a common ancestor, you know, universal common ancestor, because that's just evidence they came from a recent common ancestor of the same kind. And we think they came from the same kind. So therefore, call that evolution if you want to call that evolution. But we don't really call that evolution. We call that diversity within a kind or diversification within a kind. I'm not going to talk about what the problems with that are, but I think that's a valid observation. And I think it's a really interesting observation that. Um, that a lot of evidences for evolution are real. You know, that, that's actually part of the admission here is that, okay, yes, really organisms have amazing adaptive capacities and they have all these different mechanisms for changing. Uh, and they do go through all these different um, iterations of things and they, um, they are sculpted by their environment and all these things that evolutionary biology essentially Take, I got an evolutionary biology text up here. If I were to open that up and say, like, let's flip through it and ask how much of this is about, um, you know, stuff that's happening sort of at the species level, the origin of species. It's like, well, you know, 85% of this book is about mechanisms that are occurring like today and are making species and how do populations change over time. It means that creationists like Christian can readily accept 85% of that book. Um, it's not as quite as dramatic as you might think. Uh, and I think a lot of students of mine who, when they learn about maybe evolutionary biology, are kind of shocked at how uh, mundane and common some of this stuff is. You know, that's that these are these are mechanisms, and we're really talking about what's happening today and what's happening with species and how does speciation occur. Um, and then what, where it gets interesting, of course, is talking about long-term changes and adaption over long periods of time. But Let's move on to the next portion. OK, it explains some biogeographical puzzles. And I've pointed out some of these puzzles. And, um, and so like lemurs, right? There's a whole bunch of different species of lemurs that only live on Madagascar. And he is absolutely right. He said something that I have said before, but I've never heard another creationist say. And that is, yeah, there's a problem. You know, if, 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 there's, a, if there's 30 different lemurs, and if we were to say they weren't the same kind, we'd have to explain how all those lemur, different lemur species got to Madagascar, right? Does that mean there was 10 different lemur kinds on the ark, and then all 10 of those lemur kinds got off the ark, traveled to uh, Southern Africa, and then all had to manage to find their way through some accident, through some rafting thing or something like that, get over to Madagascar, and that's where they made their home. And by the way, that's the only place you find fossils of lemurs too, is in Madagascar. Um, you know, it, it's hard enough to explain one time it happening, getting off the ark in the Middle East and finding its way to Madagascar and only Madagascar. It would be really hard to explain that happening 10 times to animals that are similar to each other. Why would they all come together to Madagascar if they're created separately, preserved separately? Why would they go corporately to Madagascar? And you could do this 100 different times with 100 different groups of organisms. Why would those groups that are different species or different kinds stay together? Well, if they're all really one of the same kind, then it's not as big of a problem. Um, it's still a little bit of an issue. You still need to explain the, the biogeographical patterns of organisms after the arc. Um, but if you have kinds, it's a, it's a little bit easier to explain. So those are three things that... Um, um, they explain, oh, if I, there's a fourth one. It helps us to account for defense structures, parasites, poisonous creatures. Um, and that's a, that's a little bit um, harder to explain. And I'm running out of time, so I'm going to move on. Let's go down to areas of further research. You know, what do we still need to know about barominology? Barominology helps answer many questions and challenges. However, there are still areas within barominology that need more work. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I would say a lot more work. Um, what did the original created kinds look like? Ah, that's a really fascinating question. And the answers in Genesis has been kind of, you know, to, you know, they've dipped their finger, their, their toe into this pool, right? Because when they created the Ark Encounter, they kind of had to ask this question of themselves because they were going to put representations of the animals on, the, on that Ark. 
And if you go to the ark and as I've been there and I've heard people wandering around and, and they're looking at these animals like, what is that? What is that? Well, what is that? I don't even, that kind of looks like a giraffe, but I'm not sure it is. That kind of looks like a crocodile, but I, I'm not sure it is. That's because they have made the conscious decision to say that, well, if all the, all the species alive today and there's a huge diversity, but there was only two on the ark, they have to represent sort of a melding of all of those together, right? The ancestral canine can't be just a wolf, an obvious wolf. It's got to be a melding of all the different animals together into one. Um, and even there, that might not be what it looked like what God created at the beginning because there were 1600 years where they diversified before they got on the ark. And so it's really a lot of speculation as to what exactly did God make. Now, one of the problems I have with all of this is that, you know, it, it, it's a foreign world, the, the original created uh, world, if all the animals are unrecognizable to us. Um, I think the Bible is written in a fashion that suggests that the animals that Adam saw, that Adam and Eve saw, and then his, his descendants right after him are the same kind of animals that you and I would recognize today. Um, and this whole idea that that they lived in a world that was absolutely completely foreign to us and every organism was so different you would hardly even know how they would associate with modern day organisms um, just doesn't seem to seems to be a problem i'll just leave it there um all right so then you've got right well, what did they look like well there was rapid diversification this is the this is the thing you know after the flood um well, as we've seen, created kinds have undergone much diversification since creation week and then since the flood. And there are several lines of evidence these sorts of changes within created kinds were not only drastic, but also help and relatively quickly. Well, yeah, if you have 1,500 kinds of finches today, uh, and if you go back in the historical records two to 3,000 years ago, a lot of those same exact finch species lived. But if they're all related to one single pair of finch that was on the ark, that means within several hundred years or a thousand years, you had the formation of hundreds of species of finches. Or in the case of the canines, you have a hundred different species of canines because it includes the extinct ones too, which were after the flood. And so a hundred different canine species had to have evolved. And yet in the Bible, you read about foxes and you read about wolves and the descriptions of them don't sound very different than what we see today. So that meant the diversification had to happen extremely rapidly. Um, so there's rapid diversification. Um, scriptures tells us that the members of the horse and camel family, donkeys and, uh, and dromedaries and so forth, the cat kind and the dog kind were all in existence by the time of Abraham. This is, this is something that I've written about. And I like to think the Christians read that and he's kind of responding to that. Um, he certainly heard Nathaniel Jensen uh, attempt to respond to this. Um, yes, by the time of Abraham, there's descriptions of modern day, what we would recognize today instantly as to what they are. And yet the horse, if, if, um, if Christians are right, and all the different extinct horse species, including the little tiny ones that had four, you know, four parts to their hooves, right? Four hooved instead of a single hoof, um, or single toed, I guess I'm not hoof, um, then there had to have been rapid changes in those horses to the point where they became the modern horse we have today very, very quickly after the flood. Um, so as he says here, this is significant. Since Bible scholars and archaeologists date Abraham's life to the Bronze Age, most modern species have developed with perhaps a few hundred to a few thousand years after the flood. Massive, rapid speciation had to happen. So there's a big difference between modern evolutionary biology, which would look at this shockingly like all right we believe that organisms can change but we can't believe that they happen that they could happen that fast we don't see the mechanism or or the the, the genetics of how that would occur and here the creationists are like one-upping the evolutionists and saying not only do creation not only do things change they can change like overnight you know like you don't even understand how fast uh, organisms can change and adapt to their environment and evolve <laughs> um Many species still possess genetic memories of their original ancestors. Modern horses have tiny unused toe bones above their hooves. So he's, he's using the modern evidence of, well, fossils combined with genetics and anatomy to say that, yes, organisms have changed so much, they still have relic pieces, all right? And that's not evidence for evolution because this is just change within a kind, right? So, um, so there, there are 
uh, vestigial organs. But those vestigial organs is, are kind of like the product of this rapid change where species are still sort of getting used to their, their new modernness. Um, the fossil record. Um, the fossil record also demonstrates how kinds diversified into new species of the same kind after the flood. And this high diversity appears abruptly with several species uh, examples, with very few examples of intermediate species, right? They're saying, there's just, species are just popping up all over the place. Um, in fact, it's happening so fast, we didn't even expect to, to capture um, that as we do. All right, then we have so many species in so little time. I mean, it's, that's, the, that's the conclusion of those various things, right? How could the art kinds generate so much diversity in such a short amount of time? Great question. Creationist biologists think that there are genetic mechanisms that we have yet not, we have not yet discovered today. Um, and this is something I've been seeing. You know, it's like, it is a recognition that if these organisms change that fast, um, none of the mechanisms we currently understand in terms of natural selection, genetic drift, um, the types of mutations that can happen and what would cause those mutations can explain the rapidity of, of, of this action, right? How could this possibly happen? They have to say that there must be genetic mechanisms. They're not going to appeal to um, supernatural phenomena. They're not going to say, well, God just tweaked this and changed that. Um, uh, like, it, they're going to say that because God doesn't add new things since the creation is done. And so uh, they're going to look for a natural mechanism, a genetic mechanism. But they're going to say it's not yet discovered. And so they're hoping to find that. And there are young earth creationists who are constantly searching for maybe new things we're seeing in genomes that we have yet to identify that might explain how fast species can change. Um, however, they all agree that it was based on variability built into the genes of the original created kinds. You're saying like, really all young earth creationists agree at least that, I'll say that they're forced to say that um, the original created kind that God created must have had massive amounts of variation, right? Many different variations of their genes in order to allow at least the separation into separate pockets of variation that we call species. Um, but this is an acknowledgement right here that that amount of variation, still not enough. It's still not enough. You, you have to have more variation than you could possibly pack into two individuals because there's only two on the ark, much less the original creation from the original creation of the ark where some of that variation was probably lost. And uh, due to genetic entropy, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, that's for my genetic entropy friends. So th there has to have been a ton of original variation, but there probably wasn't enough. And then you have to have some other mechanism that is able to sort that variation in a very fast pace. Because even if there's a lot of variation in something, most of our understanding of how variation is sorted over time by um, recombination and then organisms being... Um, uh, selected in environments and genetic drift still doesn't explain how fast that occurs. So you need a mechanism for sorting variation and you need a mechanism for, I'll say, adding variation. And young earth creationists are more and more accepting of some mutations as being new added uh, variations. Uh, they're not going to call that new information, but it is new variations, which I think is new information. <laughs> um, so they'll say the pre-programmed diversity of kinds points to the foresight of the intelligent designer who made them, All right? The fact that there is pre, you know, there's more variation there than you expect, they think, than you would expect by evolutionary mechanisms. So therefore, that's evidence of God. You know, God is pre-programmed, and that's a design feature uh, allowing organisms to adapt to their environments. All right. Right, barominology, the study of created kinds, is a very active and exciting field. As we continue to improve our barometric methods and do more research, we inch closer and closer to a better understanding of the diversity with which God filled his world. Right? That's the question. How did, how did God fill the world with different organisms, the incredible amount of diversity we see today? Uh, the acknowledgement of creation is this, the original world didn't include the vastness of diversity that we see today, at least not in terms of separate, separate different species um, representing all that variation. Uh, it would have been pooled into much smaller units. Um, both supernaturally during the creation week and naturally through diversification. You notice naturally through diversification, right? God is no longer 
directly involved. He's only using through being uh, accomplishing his purposes through his providential mechanisms, I guess you could say. All around us, we see evidence of God's instructions for living things to fill the earth. With the help of baromenology, we're all beginning to see how God's design functions have come to fruition. All right, so Kimmy has a great hope that um, baromenology is going to be uh, something that helps us to understand variation uh, uh, in a better way. There's a lot of challenges yet uh, before baromenology, and unfortunately, there's also a lot of disagreement. Uh, unfortunately for creationists, there's a lot of disagreement between various different apologetics groups as to how uh, these uh, this diversity came about. For example, I've talked about ICR quite a bit in the past. Uh, ICR has a whole different sort of mechanism in mind um, for how diversity could come about. And I think also that they have a different view as to the extent of what of how a kind can be defined. And a kind isn't necessarily defined by the Bible. Eventually, it's going to be defined by the mechanisms and and what the science suggests is possible, I think. You know, like how much diversity is possible within a kind is kind of scientifically defined by young earth creationists uh, rather than biblically defined first. Uh, it's just the base principle of a kind is just God made things. Now we just have to find out what those things are, but we're gonna def we're gonna figure that out um, through you know uh, providential mechanisms, natural mechanisms um, through science and the scientific method. All right, I hope you see I, you know if you want to learn more, he's got a couple other articles about um, kinds, for example, specifically like how many kinds were on the ark and how to explain that. I think this is I really do think this is a a wonderful overview of what baromenology is and what young earth creationists are attempting to accomplish. And I think the state of baromenology today, I think Christian uh, Ryan has done a fantastic job and service to creationists by putting it in this particular uh, framework. And as I said before, I'm definitely gonna use this as kind of a go-to thing. I don't mind sending, especially a creationist who asks me and gets into conversation with me about baromenology and say like, you know, read this article if you really want to understand what creationists are saying about that. And I'm willing to talk about where I where I would disagree or where I think that there's going to be continued problems with baromenology. But nonetheless, it this is a this is a well thought out and explained rationale uh, for baromenology uh, and the best one that I've read thus far. All right, I hope that helps. Um, again, I don't think I even introduced myself. My name's Joel Duff, and I. Uh, and you, you learn that I'm a taxonomist uh, by training, um, but I'm also a Christian and I understand creationists quite well, having many friends that are young earth creationists and lived within creationist communities uh, in terms of my um, church life uh, for much of my life. And so I have a, a very strong interest in the development of creationism. Um, and if you read my articles on my blog, naturalhistorian.com, or watch my other videos, you'll, rec you'll recognize that I'm a critic of young earth creationism. And I think that they have gone awry on, on a number of different issues. And I disagree with their uh, interpretations of both the, the text and of science. Um, but um, they're also my brothers uh, in Christ. And I, I, I encourage people like Christian Ryan who really are thoughtful and are trying to do the best job they can um, to understand the world around us. And I look forward to um, future conversations potentially with those who um, are making earnest strides to try to understand God's world. Uh, and with that, I'll sign off. Thank you very much for learning a little bit more about baromenology.